Hello everyone, welcome to the episode 42 of Solid Saturday. The guest we have today, David Langer. He is a hands-on consultant, trainer and speaker with a mission to make data analysis skills as commonplace as skills with Excel. He founded Dev on Data to achieve this mission through the crafting and delivery of the best analytics training for all professionals regardless of role. Previously, Dev held analytics leadership roles at Schedulicity, Data Science Dojo and Microsoft. Dev has trained hundreds of professionals in the fundamentals of analytics and machine learning. And most importantly, YouTube tutorials have more than 2 million combined views. I also checked that YouTube channel and it's really, really uh, has the precise content anybody to look into. So let's just welcome him and uh, uh, Dave, I really appreciate your time and very happy to have you on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be a guest. Thank you so much. Uh, it's all my pleasure. So, uh, as I mentioned already, a lot of things and a lot of achievements in your uh, introduction itself. To start with or begin with our show, uh, the first question I would like to ask is like, you know, uh, you handled multiple roles and responsibilities along your career journey. And now you are a founder of your own company, Day One Data and analytics instruct instructor as well. So, what do you enjoy the most and why? Uh, so, one thing I enjoy a lot is teaching. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, when I started Dave on Data, it's because I really do love teaching. I've been teaching people off and on since the mid 2000s. Mm -hmm. Back then, I taught C++ programming to folks um, at community colleges in the Seattle area in Washington State. Mm -hmm. So I love teaching. I love creating content. I love teaching folks. Um, I especially love the in-classroom experience, which unfortunately right now we don't have a lot of because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but I really, really enjoyed that experience. Um, so that's part of the reason why I went the career direction that I did after Schedulicity. Okay. Uh, that being said, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was also going to say, but not only that, but also I do really like applied analytics. As you mentioned, I am a hands-on professional. Oh. That is something I do pride myself on. Even when I moved into management at Microsoft, I still made sure that I was hands-on. I still wrote code regularly. I still did analytics regularly. So... The other thing that I really enjoy is hands-on analytics, analyzing the business, trying to find the the hidden patterns that are really important to business success. Yeah, I visit uh, your post on the LinkedIn actually always, so I enjoy them really. So okay. thank you so much. You always share the knowledge. So that's great. And uh, one more question I would like to ask, as you said, that you enjoy the teaching. So when you look into the teaching aspect of it, like, you know, data science or data analytics field, do you think that um, teaching makes you more efficient or it enhances your skills more? Or how do you look into the teaching part? Oh, absolutely. Um, and if you followed me for a while on LinkedIn, you'll know that I do post this occasionally which is, um, there's an old adage that says the best way to learn something is to try and teach it to someone else. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, when I worked at Data Science Dojo, one of the things we taught was stochastic gradient descent, the algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, and having to teach it to folks and having to answer people's questions mm -hmm. really solidified the knowledge. I mean, I, I knew SGD before that, but it had been a while since I had learned the algorithm, and but teaching it really honed hone that skill in. So I find teaching is a great way to not only um, help folks out, but also mm -hmm. improve my own skills as well. Yep, yep. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, moving towards our next question, uh, you started your career journey at Microsoft as a principal architect and achieved a growth actually towards the senior director in the business intelligence and analytics. So how was that journey? And uh, from throughout that experience being with the Microsoft 8 plus years, what were the important factors of your career growth, you do you think? Okay, so first I want to establish something. I'm old. So I was actually quite experienced professional by the time I arrived at Microsoft. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I'm old. So there's all this gray area. That's part of the, that goes along with it. Um, so actually it was a very interesting experience I had at Microsoft. When I started at Microsoft uh -huh. originally in 2008, I was an enterprise architect. Mm -hmm. So I worked in the IT department of Microsoft and I had responsibilities for like, you know, the big kinds of big IT kinds of concerns that you see enterprise architects mm -hmm. worry about. Uh, for example, one of my last projects there was at that particular job at Microsoft was to create an enterprise information model 
for all of mm -hmm. Microsoft. So those are the kinds of things that I was doing at that point in time. Mm -hmm. um, I got really fascinated with data, so I decided that I was going to try a different direction. So mm -hmm. I did work for a while in SQL Server. I was a, a, a principal PM in SQL Server, mm -hmm. um, working on various products there. And then eventually I, I landed in uh, Microsoft's supply chain organization. So I was working in the Xbox division in the mm -hmm. manufacturing mm -hmm. supply chain. And I was in charge of architecting all of the BI, data warehousing, and analytics platforms that Microsoft mm -hmm. used to run the supply chain. And that during that period of time, I, um, I was studying to get my master's degree at the mm -hmm. University of Washington. And I was introduced to machine learning as part of my master's program. And then I was like totally hooked on advanced analytics at that point. Because up until that, that class, mm -hmm. I, was, I was in the descriptive analytics world. Mm -hmm. BI, data warehousing, looking backwards in time, what yeah. happened in the business and why. And mm -hmm. the machine learning let me know that I could take that data warehouse mm -hmm. and use it like a crystal ball and like mm -hmm. look into the future, make predictions. And I was totally hooked at that point. And um, I was off to the races on all aspects of analytics. It just became my passion. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a software engineer early in my career and just, I, I like analytics a lot better than software engineering. Hopefully that's oh, okay. not blasphemy to say that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's good actually. You got that vision early in your career, I guess, because when you started working, then you realized that your interest lies towards the analytics side and you took the right steps. And that's great actually because a lot of people struggle to, you know, find that interest at the first place. And then even though they find they forget about, you know, uh, like, they didn't find the correct path or they uh, lacked that vision actually to look into that area. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned that, you know, you started with the SQL actually. So we will jump on to that question first. So why SQL is so important when it comes to finding insights from data or building a model? Yeah, so as you're probably aware, um, since you follow me on LinkedIn, I post a lot about SQL and it's actually right back there. You can see it on, on my whiteboard. Um, and the reason for that is, is it's realistically, it is the lingua franca of data. Mm -hmm. um, SQL is, is a common interface to every storage platform that's in common use, whether that's Spark or Hadoop or SQL Server or Oracle or MySQL, you name it. Any storage platform that anyone's using, Snowflake, any that is using regularly has mm -hmm. a SQL interface. And the reason for that is pretty simple. The natural way to deal with data and analytics is in a tabular format. Mm -hmm. And SQL was designed, the relational model was designed around mm -hmm. a matrix, around a table format. So it's extremely important for, for no other reason because it gives you, as an analytics professional, access to the back-end storage platform. And not only that, it's a common interface to many storage platforms. So it's, it's extremely useful. Um, not to mention the fact that once you know SQL, you can actually conduct analyses directly in SQL. Yeah. For example, you can run an RFM or a Pareto analysis directly in SQL across millions and millions of rows of data. And you can't really do that very well necessarily in Excel or even in R on a laptop, let's say, because usually you don't have enough horsepower to handle all the data processing that you need to do. So you can use SQL to delegate that processing to the big horsepower of the database server or the Spark cluster or the Hadoop cluster or whatever you're using. So it's really, really super important. And it really empowers analytics professionals if, mm -hmm. once you learn sql mm -hmm. you can do so many things it's, it's it's cool stuff yeah yeah and that's a really important point actually because the base of your any data analysis or uh, building a model it is sql even though you choose python and r you are going to do some matrix preparation before that or data cleaning which is uh, sql is definitely going to help you to do that so thank you so much for sharing and moving towards your LinkedIn profile actually. Uh, your tagline says that teaching the world to 20% of analytics that drive 80% of ROI. ROI I'm taking it as a rate of interest and would like to provide more insights. So would you like to provide more insights about it? Yes, yes. And uh, hopefully that, uh, that tagline doesn't seem to... Um, <laughs> too, too, too conceited, too... You know, too too self-important. <laughs> no, it's important actually because it shows that you are able to do the analytics. It is quantifying, right? Well, it's, it's my dream to teach the world <laughs> what I think is the 20% of analytics. Yeah, so that is an important factor actually. Whatever you put the efforts in, you should be able to quantify it. Otherwise, there is no use. You, anybody can see that, say that, right? That I do the work with the efficiency, but 
what affects the efficiency like you know if you are more efficient how much efficiency you can achieve and how much time you can save that is kind of a quantification of it right so i like that tagline actually that's why i was like it's good to have that quantification yeah and it was really born of this idea that um like so many people that get into analytics especially these days and maybe they're not necessarily a trained statistician or they went to university to specifically learn analytics a lot of folks are learning it on their own and the problem is is that you get on like the linkedin feed or you go to youtube and the, the number of topics that are available is, is astronomical it's huge so for me when i was first starting out i didn't really know what to study so i kind of studied things here and there and ad hoc and what i found over the years when i was in the trenches when i was actually doing analytics day in and day out hands on Mm-hmm. was that I kept going back to the same relatively small number of techniques and, and, and um, mm-hmm. techniques and, and models all the time. I didn't really need all the things that are necessarily hot. One example is um, deep neural networks, right? Deep learning, what's commonly referred to as AI these days. It turns out that in practice, most folks don't need that. Most scenarios don't require it. Where you need it, it's, it's obviously an awesome tool. I mean, if you're mm-hmm. doing vision or if you're doing large-scale natural language processing, mm-hmm. absolutely, you got to do it. But the vast majority of the analytics that's done in, done day in and day out in companies mm-hmm. around the world doesn't require deep neural networks. So why study that? Why why emphasize that? If if that's yeah. your goal is to work computer vision for Uber or something like that, sweet, go ahead and do it. But if you want to become a business analyst at even like a company like Amazon, for example, if you mm-hmm. can look at their job descriptions. They don't mention deep neural networks at all. So the question then becomes, what are the core techniques? What are the core models? What are the core skills that you really need to actually get a disproportionate level of value? So that's what I tend to focus on. They tend to be relatively simple techniques. They're not super sexy on the feed or anything like that. There's no cool like you know computer vision videos to go along with them. But they are the kinds of things that you do day in and day out. That's what I focus on. And the great news is, is that they tend to be relatively simple. So they are accessible to a broad audience. You don't have to have a degree in computer science or math or stats to learn these things. They're actually quite quite accessible to a large audience. Yeah. Uh, so we are, I think you mentioned about you know vision that you are trying to achieve. So I'm guessing that that is the uh, vision of your organization as well. They want data. Uh, would you like to provide more insights like any interesting clients or the projects you are working on? Yeah, so right now... I just started, so I literally um, started working on Dave on Data full time about two <laughs> weeks ago. So I'm in the process right now of building uh, an online course. Mm-hmm. Um, as you probably seen from my LinkedIn feed, I have a free tutorial series that teaches folks SQL. Mm-hmm. Um, where and I just assume that all, all the person has is some knowledge of Excel. And then what I do is I teach them SQL using Excel as the the frame of reference. And I'll be doing the same thing. I'll be building an online course in R, which mm-hmm. is exactly the same thing, which is, which is this idea of like, hey, you want to learn to do some advanced analytics, mm-hmm. but you don't have a background in computer science or mathematics, no problem. If you know Excel, I can teach you R. And once you learn mm-hmm. R, you can do all kinds of cool things. So that's what I'm currently working on right now. In addition to um, some of the things that I'm doing with TDWI, which is a company that I partner with to do analytics training and speaking. Okay. So that's that's my current project right now. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, moving towards our next question, you already mentioned business analyst in the one of your answers actually. So how do you differentiate the data analytics from the business analytics? Yeah, that's a good related, Yeah, yeah that, that's a great question. Um, Semantics matter. Mm-hmm. Like what's a data? What's a data scientist versus a data analyst versus a business analyst? So, so semantics matter, especially in this space, because there's a lot of folks that are aspiring to get into the field of analytics, and they need to know what these terms mean because it might mean these are the kinds of things I should study or I should learn. Um, so, I tend to think of data analytics as a broad umbrella mm-hmm. versus business analytics, which I think is a subset of data analytics. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, what I tend to, the the biggest differentiator for me is causality, essentially. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're a scientist, if you are a, um, if you're a scientist working for a drug company, you want to establish causality for a drug. 
does this drug actually work? Does it do what we think it's doing? So you conduct a randomized experiment, you know, you conduct the experiments double blind, and then you can infer from the results whether or not there's causality. Does the drug work? Yes or no. So I consider that kind of like the breaking point um, for a lot of things in, the, in these definitions. Because most of the time in business analytics, you're not really looking for causality because typically you can't because you're not running an experiment. You're typically looking at observational data, what's happening in the business, and you're trying to infer why. So business analytics tends to deal more with like finding, mining interesting associations in the data. So, for example, um, a good tool in business analytics, I argue, is market basket analysis, which is typically used in retail industry a lot. It's not causality. Just because you happen to be buying diapers does not mean you're going to buy beer. <laughs> it's not a causal relationship. <laughs> Maybe it's a, it's a, maybe it's a very unlikely relationship. Maybe there's a high association and maybe you might want to capitalize on that as a, as a business, but it's not causality. So I tend to think of business analytics as those techniques mm -hmm. where you're mining interesting associations that then the business can use to either lower costs or increase revenue. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, just to like, you know, simplify the definition to the audience, it is more over like when you look into the business analytics, uh, you look for more uh, on the business perspective, I would say data analytics is more like uh, uh, digging deep into the data. And when it comes to the business analytics, uh, can I say that it is more about how business looks, looks into it rather than putting like data analytics might be a little more technical compared to uh, business analytics. Mm, that 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 might, that's that was certainly I would argue the case maybe twenty years ago, but like these days, if you look at lots of business analyst positions in lots of companies, they're more technical now than they used yeah. to be. <laughs> so, for example, a lot of them are asking for SQL skills. A lot of them yeah. are asking for quantitative skills and quantitative analysis. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so yeah, yeah, as you mentioned, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 20 years ago, maybe it was less, but I would say now it's, it's yeah. the, the bar is starting to rise. Yeah. So just to, uh, just to be like, you know, a little curious about like you worked in the data field like uh, quite a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, how do you see that actually? How is it getting into the shape now over the period of time? Uh, so it's definitely... So uh, yes, I've been in I've been in the analytic space. I've been in the data space for quite a while. Uh, when I first started, um, of course, there's always been predictive analytics. That's always existed. Right? It's always been around. Mm -hmm. But at the time when I got started, it was a relatively small niche kind of thing. It hadn't really exploded yet, like it, like it is now, where everyone's interested in doing advanced analytics or predictive analytics. Mm -hmm. So um, and that's been the biggest change that I've seen. Like when I first got started, it was all about descriptive analytics. It was all about, do mm -hmm. you have a good data warehouse? Oh. Do you have sufficient level of reporting? Mm -hmm. Can you have good dashboards? All that, which by the way, all that's still critical. You still have to have all of that. Mm -hmm. It's the foundation. Yes. <laughs> but that was, that was basically the emphasis. That's where all the money was spent. You didn't have data scientists and you didn't mm -hmm. have, this idea of like, well, we need to put predictive models everywhere because it could give us an, an advantage to our business. It was more more isolated. So that's probably been the single biggest thing. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, um, just to my observations of the job descriptions that I research from time to time, it looks like that that's kind of gone along, along that path as well, where the level of technical rigor expected in many business analyst positions has gone up over time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Moving towards our next question is about, uh, you already mentioned about your, uh, you know, uh, work experience at Data Science Dojo, a little bit about your work experience, but uh, would you like to share more about, you know, particular your roles and responsibilities as a VP of Data Science? Yes. Yeah, so Data Science Dojo um, is a, a small company. It was a startup um, and it was when I worked there as well. And I think we were around seven employees at the time that I worked there. And our business model was we ran week-long intensive boot camps. So I would fly around the United States and Canada, wow. um, usually two weeks out of the month. I'd uh -huh. be on the road. Uh -huh. And we would run a week-long boot camp. So like 10 hours a day, Monday through wow. Friday. We would uh -huh. like teach people the basics of 
our programming, various types of algorithms, uh, recommender systems, mm-hmm. you know, big data storage solutions, Hadoop and Hive and things like that in a week-long intensive boot camp format. Um, I was a lead instructor, so I did, like I said, about two weeks out of the month, I was on the road teaching the boot camps, and then the other two weeks of the month, I was in the office developing content, um, helping us expand the business, grow the business through various types of initiatives, not the least of which was um, I was the primary person that created our meetup content, delivered our meetups as part of our content marketing strategies, mm-hmm. um, and had a you know, I have my hands in all different kinds of pies, right? There's the cliche of like wearing many hats mm-hmm. at, the, at the startup. And that's exactly what I was doing. Yeah. But I, I feel that, you know, uh, whatever you put efforts in, like, you know, in your career uh, path along the career your career journey, uh, it definitely shows in your content and the posts. So uh, I visited your YouTube channel also. It has only limited videos, but, you know, uh, it has a great, great content. So definitely, you know, uh, it's very valuable to have that kind of experience. And I'm very happy to have you on the show. Actually, thank you so much for providing your time. Oh, yeah, no problem. Yeah. And as uh, I can truly say that you are leading the data analytics space, so what is your leadership style and any specific leader that you always follow or admire and why? Yeah, so I, I don't, I don't consider myself a uh, an expert on like leadership in management theory. <laughs> like, yeah, eventually you become. So. <laughs> yeah, I just I just kind of became a manager and just did my best. Um, but generally speaking, um, because I come from a software engineering background, because because I come from a technical background professionally, uh, I tended to f- I tended to like leaders that I work for that were hands-on, that had skills. They were technical in some way so that we could have high bandwidth conversations. So that's that's kind of what I always prided myself on as a manager. I wasn't going to be just a professional manager. I was going to be a manager that also had hands-on technical skills. And in that regard, I would say that um, if I had to pick somebody as a leadership role model, um, it would be Alexander the Great. Um, because my understanding was, okay. this might be... This might be legend, by the way. This might be legend. <laughs> yeah, it's a legend. But my understanding was is that he fought in the front lines with his troops. Right? He wasn't like, you know, like this king that sat at the back and just watched the battlefield from afar. He was actually in the thick <laughs> of it, and that inspired his troops. That's that's my understanding. So I've always kind of, um, I've always kind of thought that was a, a great role model, especially in the technical space. Is if the, the, the equivalent of that in the technical space is, can you code? Can you do the technical things? Do you understand? As opposed to being just a professional manager who might have come from, I don't know, some non-technical space. There's always that problem with software engineers, in my experience in particular, they really like to work for somebody that knows how to code. <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. I, I also belong to the software engineering side, uh, and I definitely can relate to that. I don't like the managers who can't resolve the issues. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it is more or like if you are tech friendly as well, like your manager is tech friendly, then it's very, it makes your task easy and you look for like, you know, um, look forward to become like that. So um, how was your like, you know, uh, experience being managing the team actually? So as you worked as a lot more in the lead instructor side or uh, lead manager kind of. Yeah. So, um, the way, so my management style was primarily, so obviously when you're a manager, you have to follow the HR rules. That's, that's comes with the gig, right? You got to manage budget and you have to manage HR policies. That's, that comes with the territory. That on the side, my primary focus as a manager was that of mentorship uh, because what I was really interested in and what I really enjoyed doing was trying to help the folks that I managed define their career goals and help them achieve their career goals. Mm-hmm. So, for example, one of the things I used to say a lot when I worked as a manager at Microsoft was, look, I want you to have a long and happy and productive career at Microsoft. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's on my team, maybe it's in this organization, but maybe it's not. So let's see what we can do um, to make sure that that happens. And, of course, we're going to try and keep you on the team or in our organization. And then at the very least, we're going to try and keep you inside of Microsoft if we can. So, but, the, but the focus was still on the employee. What, what was their goals? What did they want to do? You know, that sort of thing. And then trying to find 
um, opportunities for those people to exercise new skills or acquire new experiences that would help them along their career path, whatever that might be. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, moving towards the guidance, actually, any online courses or books would you like to recommend to the audience who are looking to learn and explore about this spirit? Yeah, so there's a few books that um, I really, 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 really like and, and recommend constantly, as you're probably aware, <laughs> from my LinkedIn feed. So for anyone who's interested in getting into data analysis, and they're like, well, I don't really understand what data analysis means in terms of a business context. The single best book I've ever found is a book called Making Sense of Data by Dr. Donald J. Wheeler. Um, that is a, it is a great book. Um, it is a cornerstone of a lot of the um, content that I publish on LinkedIn, for example, um, including some courses that I've built for TDWI and um, an online course that my partner has built for TDWI as well on business analysis. And it all focuses on that, the stuff you learn in that book. And it's, it's, it's awesome. It's like the best book great. ever. Yeah, so that's a great one. Um, I also like for folks that are interested in learning a little bit more about statistics, like traditional frequentist statistics, um, there's a website called statisticsbygim.com, mm -hmm. and it's Jim Frost's website. Mm -hmm. And he has a number of ebooks, and they are all awesome. He's, he, writes, uh, he writes in a very intuitive style, minimal mathematics, focus on the concepts, Mm -hmm. using a lot of graphs and charts to emphasize the ideas behind statistics and mm -hmm. it's great stuff. It's, it's those two resources are awesome and they are broadly applicable to anybody, right? If you don't have a background in comp sci, if you don't have a background in math and stats, it doesn't matter. These books are, yeah. you can totally Thank you so much for sharing actually. This is going to be very useful for the audience. Uh, who are looking to you know uh, explore this field because uh, when you google nowadays it is like you know a uh, market is so much saturated you find like tons of books talking about uh, everything like you know python r data analysis machine learning it's very hard to choose one so thank you so much for sharing and uh, moving towards our last question to end the show is uh, any tips or advice to the students or professionals who are looking to enter or transform their career in the data science or grow in this specific field? Yeah, so uh, for those folks that are interested in getting in analytics and are already in industry, or they already are working a job, mm -hmm. um, the, the single biggest piece of advice that I can give is bloom where you're planted. So, for example, uh, if you work in HR, let's say, mm -hmm. and you're interested in getting into analytics, but you're like, well, I don't know what I can do. Mm -hmm. You can do tons and even in HR, right? It's just think of the things, think of the business questions that are really important. Once again, in the HR space, think of, for example, hey, is the attrition in organization A significantly higher than organization mm -hmm. B? That's an interesting question that I can imagine HR professionals might contemplate. So. Focus on those business questions and learn the tools and techniques that help you answer those questions. And that's how you get started. Mm -hmm. um, and the great news is, is that often, if you do stuff like that, you start to get recognized in your job as someone that knows about data. Yeah. And sometimes you end up getting more and more data work. And then eventually mm -hmm. you might be able to work yourself into a formal role. Yeah. That's, that's like the great thing. If that never happens, it's okay too because at least you're getting the experience. At least you're getting the experience of actually learning the technique and applying it in a real world business situation. And that's something you can talk to in yeah. a interview, for example. Yeah. So that's what I would recommend. Bloom where you're planted, think about the business questions that you can answer with data, and then focus on the tools and techniques that are appropriate for answering that question. Now that's kind of different than what a lot of people might say. They might say, like, oh, you need to learn Python. Go learn Python. I'm like, no, 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 no. Look, you can do these analyses in Excel. That's more important than learning Python because a lot of business analyst jobs don't necessarily require Python skills, but they do require you to have quantitative data analysis skills. Yeah, that's very true and very wise actually because it's very important to build that thought process as you mentioned that understand the business problem and then look for because technology comes later on actually. First, it is understanding of what you're looking for, your business requirements or business case that you're going to work on. So thank you so much for sharing and I really enjoyed talking to you and audience definitely you are going to enjoy this episode and I would encourage you to check out his YouTube channel as well. 
because it has very good content and i can say it or i don't have to say it it actually has already 2 million views so thank you so much and as i always say until we meet happy leading let's sit together stay safe bye for now thank you